Collins. Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday night edition. Our topic is dissecting malignant intraocular lesions from diagnosis to management. And deliver the education with Dr. Aaron Gold, a graduate of Nova Southeast University's College of Optometry, uh, where he and I met. He was one of my former students. He worked and taught within the Ocular Oncology Clinic at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute for several years. And he left to join Dr. Tim Murray to found the Murray uh, Ocular Oncology and Retina Service. He's well trained to use interpretation of echography, photography, uh, and tomography. Uh, he has really made a, a firm contribution to our education and knowledge in terms of interocular malignancies. Uh, this is going to be really a dynamic presentation. It will bring a lot of information to everybody. And Dr. Gold's goal has always been to practice the science and art of optometry, always emphasizing quality and care and excellent patient services at all time. And he's got a firm commitment to optometric education. So with that, Dr. Aaron Gold, please take it away. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm trying to unpause my screen. Ah, resume share. Here we go. And we'll dive right in. I think we'll dive right in. Give me one second. There we go. I have no financial disclosures. Okay, guys. And like I said, we'll dive right in. We're gonna we're gonna be talking about the the more dangerous tumors um, in the eye, and um, the first one is is this one right here. Uh, can everyone see my my cursor here? We've got we can. beautiful, beautiful. We've got a a pretty clear image, fundus in, image into the right eye, and what kind of stares us right in the face is this very large lesion. We can tell that it's under the retina. We can see the retinal vasculature and we can tell that it's pigmented and there are different types of pigment, right? It, there, there's some, some dark gray areas. There's some areas here that are orange. There's some areas here that are, that are lighter that may represent some fluid under the retina. This is a choroidal lesion. And this is a classic choroidal, a large classic choroidal melanoma. And this is the most common primary intraocular neoplasm in adults. Um, the incidence is about five per million per year in the U.S., and it tends to affect people with lighter skin and lighter eyes. Um, European ancestry have about eight times uh, greater chance of developing melanoma. Later in life is also great greater chance. Now, when I say this, this is um, tongue in cheek because I've seen patients of of all ancestry and of all ages with melanoma, as young as I think we had an eight year old with with a, with a, a coronal melanoma. Um, the, if patients have nevus avoda, ocular dermal melanocytosis, they have a much higher chance of developing melanoma. Um, it's about one out of 300 to one out of 400, depending on, on um, the, the source, the literature. And then the question is the sun, environmental factors. Does, does the sun play a, a big part in, in melanoma? Well, we know it plays a huge part in cutaneous and skin melanoma. When it comes to eye melanoma, um, the choroid is, is where you find melanomas 80% of the time and the lens is protecting the choroid compared to say the iris. So we don't think that, that UV plays as much of an effect, but there are, there are competing studies for that too. Going back to nevus avoda, here's a great example. If anyone's seen nevus avoda, ocular derma melanocytosis, basically the uveal tissue has, is packed with melanocytes. And in this patient's right eye, you can see that kind of blue nevus, that blue nevus avoda. And then there, you also see the darker fundus. And the darker fundus has nothing to do with the RPE. The RPE is probably uniform and about the same. It's, it's all under the RPE. It's in the choroid where you're seeing it packed with melanocytes. So they have a much higher chance of, of developing uh, melanoma. When we have patients that come in with nevus avoda, we watch them twice a year, um, starting at, at as soon as we see them, even if they're, if they're children, okay? And histo, the, the histopathology of these lesions usually is a combination of spindle cells and epithelioid cells. The more dangerous are, are when they're mixed. Um, we're going to talk more about genetics later on, but in general, the loss of chromosome three has a, a much higher propensity of having, having melanoma and, in fact, a more dangerous type of melanoma. It's, it turns out not all uveal melanoma is the same. Some are more dangerous than others, and we're going to talk about that when we get into the genetics. So when you see these, they're typically presented as elevated choroidal lesions that are usually pigmented, but don't have to be pigmented. 
When they spread, they tend to go 90% of the time they'll go to the liver, then the lungs, and then other usually connective tissue. But the liver and the lungs are the two favorite sites of these, of these lesions when they do spread. And in the past, when I started giving this lecture years ago, that meant death. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, about changes that have happened that doesn't, metastasis doesn't necessarily correlate with mortality anymore. Um, the diagnosis of this is made in the eye exam. You know, um, other, other doctors, when they, when they want to see if a lesion is, is cancerous or not, they biopsy it. They, they take it out. The, the concern for many, many years was if you try to take a piece of this in the eye, you may cause seeding. So using indirect ophthalmoscopy and echography and other ancillary testing, we've gotten incredibly good at diagnosing these without removing them from, from the eye. And remember, we're, we're using microscopes all the time. You know, it's not, not as microscopic as, as under an actual microscope with histopathology, seeing things a thousand times their size. But we've gotten very good at this, and, and we almost have a 100% um, uh, rate of, of correctly diagnosing these. And then, you know, we, we don't use fluorescein angiography anymore, but um, one pathognomonic um, feature of, of fluorescein angiography, a dual circulation pattern, was that used to be path that was called pathognomonic for melanoma. If you saw a, a circulation pattern basically feeding into the tumor from the retinal vasculature and the choroidal vasculature, that was that was um, a diagnosis of melanoma. And I actually have an example of that coming up. But more importantly is, is echography. So here's a B scan. Acoustic hollowing just, just refers to the, the lightening of the acoustic reflectivity inside. It's, it's the A scan that has the low internal acoustic reflectivity that I'm going to show you in a second. But usually this is a little lighter on the inside. So of course, we're looking inside the eye. Here's the vitreous cavity. Here's the back wall of the eye. Here's, you know, the very front of this is the retina. And then this is the choroid. And here is the sclera behind it. You can see that little dip there. That is a, that's a sound artifact. That's a sound wave artifact called choroidal excavation um, that's sometimes seen with choroidal melanoma. And you can also have these kind of collar button looks. This is not a collar button lesion. This is a collar button lesion. So this is the kind of the classic collar button. Collar buttoning on echography is almost pathognomonic for melanoma. There have been some rare cases of other lesions um, that have simulated melanoma. I have a, a whole simulation um, uh, lecture that that you know is is a different lecture. But this is a a perfect example of a collar button lesion. And what's happening here is this tumor is breaking through the RPE. This is this is where the melanoma origina originated. And what it's doing is it's tenting up the retina. That's what you're seeing here. That's that's a retinal detachment, a serous retinal detachment. Here's a retinal detachment. The echographer thought this was just a vacuole, just happened to be a vacuole. It could be very low internal acoustic reflectivity when through the A scan. And here's an A scan. So the front of the eye, vitreous, the retina, high internal acoustic reflectivity with the A scan. The melanoma itself has, has pretty low internal acoustic reflectivity. And here's the sclera. Why? Why is it so low? Well, these are primary lesions. They're cancerous. They're typically uniform. And it's thought that the sound waves will, will kind of go through them the way light goes through a crystal. And that's why, and there's not a lot of bounce back. And that's why you're having this low internal acoustic reflectivity. Okay. And here's, here's a picture I'm um, coming up of um, dual circulation pattern um, with FA. This is breakthrough of the RPE. You can see there's hemorrhaging around with this tumor. It's actually a very large melanoma and it has very little breakthrough. It's kind of like a, a reverse um, collar button. Here's the FA. When you have this kind of hypofluorescence, in this case, this was done on a Heidelberg. Here's the, here's the, the dual circulation pattern. Retinal vasculature, choroidal vasculature, all feeding the, the tumor. This dark area is really just artifact. That's that's because um, in this particular FA, it has to be focused in the right plane for you to get an image. Um, it's it's a cool picture. Clinically, it's not so important. You know, we've been we've been moving away from fluorescein angiography lately. We do we have started to use more uh, fundus autofluorescence. And those, the other tumors I've been showing you have kind of been in your face, no question, melanoma. But what about this? This lesion, 
it goes, you know, this, this person has a relatively light fundus, at least over here, and you can see where the lesion ends. It's, it's a, a pretty diffuse lesion. It's not a super thick lesion. This is 2.1 millimeters thick, and it has some funny colors here. So is this just a, a suspicious nevus, or is this, is this a melanoma? And, and, you know, years ago, the Shields, Carol Shields, developed a mnemonic, um, two fine, small ocular melanoma. And then she added later on using helpful hints daily. And then she added later on from that, um, doing imaging, talking about the diameter of the lesion. Um, but the two fine, small ocular melanoma was, was basically the, the features of a suspicious nevus. Is it not a nevus? Is it actually a small melanoma? So two is for thickness, over two millimeters thick. Find is for subretinal fluid. Small is for symptoms, flashing, floaters. Ocular is for orange pigment, the lipofusin. Melanoma is for are there margins at disc. And then she added the using helpful hints daily, the, the hollow ultrasound, a halo absent, and drusen absent. I'm going to talk about those. Let, let's talk about those right now, actually. We talked about the hollow ultrasound, really low internal acoustic reflectivity, a halo absent. Some, some lesions have halos around them. Um, they tend to be more stable. They tend to have a, a lower incidence of, of uh, melanoma. And there's some question about, was there some kind of inflammatory condition with a nevus years ago that caused that kind of halo? Well, if you don't have a halo, it's, it's a little more suspicious. Same, same thing with Drusen. Drusen absent, um, the idea of Drusen suggests that there's chronicity of the lesion. So if you don't see Drusen, is this lesion new? There's one little red herring there. You know, I get a little um, perturbed when I hear a, a colleague say, oh, that tumor has drusen, so I'm not worried about it, where there's only drusen on like one side of it, and then the other half of it has no drusen, because you can have a transformed nevus. You, most of these melanomas we know now are de novo. They come from, from nothing, but you can have a stable nevus for many, many years transformed to melanoma. The issue with this mnemonic is that it employs using an ultrasound. That's why Dr. Shields added um, um, doing imaging to see the diameter of the lesion. Um, more recently, there's another acronym that Bertil um, D'Amato has come up with. It's called MOLES, and here it is. And the MOLES acronym is interesting because it uses a scoring system. For First of all, the, it's, it's an acronym. It's not a mnemonic. So, so the acronym stands for mushroom-shaped, orange pigment, large size, and there's specific criteria for the large size, enlarging tumor, and subretinal fluid. For this acronym, you assign a scoring system. If the feature is present in the MOES, the, the mushroom shape, orange pigment, enlarging tumor, or subretinal fluid, that's two points for each one that's present. If it might be present, that's one point. And if it's not present, it's zero points. You can see for the large size, the thickness depends on whether it's a zero, one, or two. If it's less than one millimeter thick, then it's a zero. If it's between one and two millimeters thick, it's it's a one. And if it's greater than two millimeters thick, it's a two. And this is, th this is really supposed to be eyeballing it, not with an ultrasound, okay? Same thing with diameter. That's why we're doing disc diameters and not millimeters. If it's about less than three disc diameters, then it's, it's a zero. If it's greater than four disc diameters, it's two points. And if it's between three and four, if you're not sure, it's one point. The kicker here is when you add up all the points, if you have greater than three points, um, they, Dr. Dr. D'Amato says there's a 97% chance that you have a melanoma and, and really greater than three points is, is a prompt for urgent referral. So let's go back to that lesion and let's employ both the mnemonic that the shields have and the acronym that, that Dr. D'Amato has using the shields. You can see that there's definitely orange pigment. One thing I didn't mention with the shields is for the first five things, if you had two of them there was a 38% chance of growth. In other words, there was a 38% chance you were dealing with a melanoma if you had, it, for just one risk factor rather. If you had two risk factors, there was a 50% chance. When she added the other criteria, then that changed to two risk factors and three risk factors. But the, the original um, uh, study suggested just one risk factor of the first five had a 38% chance that you were dealing with a melanoma. So going back here, Definitely with, with the shields, you have the orange pigmentation, you have the margin at disc. I would argue that even though this is two-dimensional image, this looks like subretinal fluid. You can see kind of rest, retinal striae here. 
And to me, that suggests that there's a little fluid under the retina. If I was doing the moles acronym, I would label that a one, right? I'm not sure that there's fluid under the retina. And I would label the, 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 the thickness, it's a two-dimensional image, maybe a one, but, but the orange pigment is definitely a two, and that's enough for an urgent referral for me. Same thing here. Here's another. Here's hey, another. Hey, theme. Aaron, can you go back? Sure. Is the orange pigment in the center there, or is it the surrounding halo? It is in the center. That's a great okay. question. This is the orange pigment that we're referring to. Notice the orange pigment actually kind of melds in with the fundus. And a lot of times it will look like fundus. It'll almost look like the tumor is broken up. But you're, what you're looking at here is normal color of the, the RPE on the fundus versus lipofusin. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Here's it, here it's a little more obvious that the color of, of this is different than, than the rest of the fundus. And this doesn't have you know the diffuseness that the other lesion has. This is pretty well circumscribed for a choroidal lesion. So what do we do about these? What do we do? Well, once we diagnose these, we can do a few different things. The, the old treatment was to take the eye out. Um, mid 80s, early 90s, the Clabber ocular melanoma study showed that radiation for, for certain melanoma was perfectly appropriate. And we're going to talk about that. There are some countries that use gamma knife. And then I have on here um, transpupillary thermotherapy. The shields use this with the radiation. They, they use what's what they call a sandwich um, technique. They do the transpupillary thermotherapy, then they do the radiation. And then, and when I say radiation, in this case, I'm talking about brachytherapy. And then they do thermotherapy again. They do that not to make sure they've killed the lesion, but to, to prevent side effects that we're going to be talking about in just a little bit. One thing I didn't mention on this is proton beam therapy. Proton beam therapy is a type of external beam radiotherapy that's very precise. Um, Dr. Greg Gudis and Dr. Ivana Kim do that in, in uh, Boston, and they have results that are similar to anyone else that does the um, brachytherapy. And we'll talk a little bit about the brachytherapy. Some lesser um, successful techniques, I should say, Resection. I don't know if anybody's seen a video on iTube of, of removing a tumor under air. It looks really cool. Unfortunately, they don't show you that, that um, in many cases they lose the eye. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not very helpful. Laser photocoagulation. Um, in the past, laser ablation had a low local tumor control rate. We're employing that for some tumors with some other things that I'm going to talk about a little later. Um, I think the key with the laser photocoagulation is, is it only penetrates so far. If you're going to try to uh, laser a lesion that's more than three millimeters thick, you may not kill the lesion. You may, you may not have lo local tumor control. And then there've been some other, other things. I, I, we had a patient that was, I think they, they were, were somewhere in South America that had cryotherapy. They actually uh, did very well with that. Um, I don't know how big the tumor was to begin with, but it was very small when we saw them. So I mentioned the collaborative ocular melanoma study for the for the brachytherapy, and, and that was a study that a prospective study that started in the mid 80s that ran into the 90s that had two trials. It had a medium tumor trial and a large tumor trial. And what they were assessing is first they, they defined a medium tumor. Originally, they defined it as three to eight millimeters in apical height. They expanded that to 2.5 to 10 millimeters in apical height or 16 millimeters, less than 16 millimeters in diameter. For that medium trial, they were comparing brachytherapy versus enucleation and seeing the mortality rates when employing those two things. For the large tumor trial, um, which they defined as lesions that were greater than 10 millimeters in apical height or greater than 16 millimeters in diameter, they were comparing enucleation alone versus a type of EBRT pre-enucleation radiotherapy, then enucleation. Later on, there was a small tumor trial. Um, it was an observational trial to see if tumors that were less than 2.5 millimeters were safe to watch. Um, they were safe to watch, um, but, but let's go back to the medium and the, the large. When we talk about um, mortality rate, the problem with, with melanoma is that they can seed to the liver before um, anybody knows it. And, and the, even looking at the liver, you can have microscopic metastases that can be dormant for years. And that's a problem. So, so what this this was looking at five year data, and this looked at enucleation versus the brachytherapy for medium sized tumors, and they saw there was really no difference in in mortality 
um, all-cause mortality and melanoma metastasis mortality. There was really no difference. It was about the same. Um, you can see it's not statistically significant, but you can see actually for the, the melanoma confirmed metastasis, it's a little bit lower um, than enucleation. But all this is saying is when you radiate the tumor with Reiki therapy, you are doing as good a job as taking the eye out. And we, we try to stress that to patients that we offer that treatment for. The large tumor study showed that um, doing a radiation, doing, doing the radiation before the enucleation didn't impact the rate of metastasis. There was concern that waiting longer could actually increase the chance of metastasis. It wasn't statistically significant, but they actually had smaller numbers of, of patients that had the pre-enucleation radiation. Um, that tells us now that if we have a large tumor, we are actually trying to do Reiki therapy if we can before um, going right to enucleation. That said, there are times where we cannot do brachytherapy. Um, if the lesion is greater than 18 millimeters wide in diameter, we have to take the eye out. And the reason for that is the plaque can only keep, be made 22 millimeters wide. And I'm going to show you some, some plaques in a second. The plaque can only be made 22 millimeters wide. And we want two millimeters on each end clearance. So we don't want the tumor to be more than 18 millimeters or else we, we risk not covering the entire tumor when we put the brachytherapy plate on, when we put the plaque on um, and we worry about there, there being no local tumor control. Other instances, if we have extraocular extension, if the tumor is growing out of the eye, we have to take the eye out. Um, that said, if it's only a millimeter, if it's, if it's, if it's just a little extraocular extension where there's no in thickness, Tim has patched those lesions. And if there's a problem, then we, then we take the eye out. If there's pigment dispersion of the lesion uh, before anything is done, we need to take the eye out. So those are some cases where we need to take the eye out. And I actually have some pictures of that. So let's take a look at those. So you, you really can't see this, this, but um, you can see the retinal detachment. It's actually a very pretty picture, unfortunately, but this person has an enormous melanoma in the back of their eye. Um, this eye had to come out. I have another picture that's a kind of a graphic picture of an eye that that also was completely filled with tumor. Um, actually, this picture is the picture that that kind of um, you know gave me the the idea for the name, the title of this lecture, um, because this is a literal dissection of an enormous melanoma. This is one of the biggest melanomas I've ever seen that does not have extraocular extension. One other reason to take the eye out um, is if the tumor is surrounding the optic disc more than 180 degrees. If it's 360 degrees around the optic disc, we worry about um, growing into the optic disc and or into the optic nerve rather, and we don't want to risk it. We want to take the eye out for that. And that, here's a, an example of that. There's, a, there's an ocular oncologist in New York, very good ocular oncologist in New York, Paul Finger. He has a, a plaque that actually has a little slot on the back. It's, it's a patented slotted plaque where he can put radioactive seeds along the slot and irradiate the optic nerve also. But when it's 360 degrees, I, I, I may stand corrected, but I think he would still enucleate this eye and not take any chances. Here's another example. Um, the patient uh, presented with the picture on the left, and this is actually only 1.5 millimeters thick. We brought them back in three months. It was still 1.5 millimeters thick. We brought them back in four months, and it had actually doubled in thickness. You can see that it's it's also changed here. So this eye, and this is a nice example of an amelanotic melanoma. And it, it did double in size and we had to take the eye out. Here's a nice example of extraocular extension. And here's another one. And this, this is kind of, you know, unfortunate. This patient also had a PK at one point. Someone did a great job at, at replacing their cornea. Um, this is not just prolapse of uveal tissue. One way you can tell the difference is an ultrasound. If there's if there's lesion underneath, that's how you tell. And usually when we look at things towards the front of the eye, you know, this is not not this is just around the equator, but when we're looking at things closer to the eye, to the front of the eye, we'll sometimes do an ultrasound biomicroscopy. And I have an example of that. That's a high resolution ultrasound. If you look closely, you can see some extraocular extension. This is actually in the OR, ready to, for an enucleation, unfortunately, for this patient. I don't know um, um, why they waited um, so long for this. This was, it looks like they, they, it looks like it was painful. You can actually have a type of melanoma 
um, uh, from uh, uveal melanoma, melanocytic melanoma, uh, or as a type of glaucoma rather, from melanoma, melanocytic glaucoma. That's that's very painful. I don't know if this patient had that, but that looks like a very painful, angry eye. And it had to come out. And here's the last example of an eye that has to be inoculated. The lesion is here. This is all pigment dispersion. And, and the concern, of course, is that there's just kind of this natural seating and we don't want to take the chance. We want to take the eye out. Um, there are some lesions that are heavily pigmented like an optic disc melanocytoma that can sometimes have this pigment dispersion. And that's safe. Um, melanocytomas have about a 2% chance of transforming to melanoma. But, but in general, if it's not transformed to melanoma, it's, it's safe. So those are all the examples of, of eyes that have lesions that, that the eye needs to come out to save, to keep the patient alive. What about- So Aaron, you, yes. Aaron, you mentioned seeding there. Does that mean like same as spreading? Is that the same yes. as metastasizing? Like you said, it's seeded right. into the liver. Is that kind of the same? So, so I think you can, I think you can interchange those. Usually um, in the eye, when I talk about seeding, I'm, I'm usually referring to, to within the eye, but I think that, that that's a, a fair to, to use the term seeding to any place is, is, is a metastasis. I think that's a, a, a fair description of it. And we don't want it. We don't want spread. You know, that's, that's the name of the game with, with many cancers, right? And, 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 and to remind the audience, these are tumors that are localized here, starting mm -hmm. like, you know, I have, a, I have an uncle that has kidney cancer and it kind of spread to his lung and so on and so forth. Um, this is, you know, so it started in the kidney. This is tumors that are starting in the eye, right? Absolutely. Correct. Okay. This is all, everything that we're talking about so far is starting in the eye. Perfect. Aaron, uh, to, to put things in perspective, on, on our polling question, a number of our audience have, have never diagnosed a, a melanoma. On average, how many melanomas do you see in a week? <laughs> well, on Monday, we had, um, I think we had 75 patients. It was a light day. And I think a third of them were melanomas. Now, we didn't diagnose all of them that day. We, we usually, we, we have a lot of follow-ups and usually we'll have between 12 and 20 new patients a week. We, we, we see patients three days a week in clinic. In clinic, we have between 75 and 90 patients a day. Uh, just to give you an idea, we have three techs working up patients. We have one photographer, our, our ultrasonographer sometimes does photography. And then we have one, one ultrasonographer, her only job is ultrasound. And she's actually the second ultrasonographer we, we had. Um, the, the first one, we took with us from Bascom Palmer and she just retired, but she still comes half of the time. So we have one to two ultrasonographers and then we have nurses prepping patients for injection therapy. I haven't even gotten to treatment yet. So it's, it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a busy time in the office. A lot of thing, a lot of times I'll have patients and friends um, say, you know, what's going, not, not so much the patients. I think the patients understand, but friends and colleagues say, Hey, the patient only has like two minutes with you. And that's true. They have two to five minutes with us, but they've already had their workup, their ancillary testing. You know, we do that all in the office. They don't have to go someplace to get the ultrasound and come back or talk to the doctor later, like most of us do if we're, if we're getting our heart checked. So they're, they're pretty, um, the patients are pretty happy. I, I make sure the patients are happy with their experience before they leave, that they get their answer, their questions answered. A lot of patients that have to have treatment for side effects from melanoma or something else going on in the retina, are kind of, you know, they know, they know the deal. New patients get more time, of course, especially if it's a new diagnosis of a melanoma, we can spend 20 minutes with a, with a new patient, just, just with the doctors, just with me and Dr. Murray, we can, we can be talking to them um, for, for quite a while so that we have all of our ducks in a row. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. So let's, let's get into, so this was so far, we've, we've kind of had the bad news stuff, the nucleation. Let's go into brachytherapy. Let's go, go to, um, radioactive iodine plaque brachytherapy. So that's a, a, an iodine seeds are sewn to a gold plaque, okay? And these are rice side seeds. Why do we use a gold, a gold plaque, a gold bowl? It's because gold will prevent the radiation. It will block the radiation from affecting the rest of the, the, the head, similar to um, um, lead, except without the nasty lead poisoning aspect of lead. So gold works very, very well. The plaque is sewn right onto the sclera. So the, the conjunctiva is removed. Um, sometimes a muscle has to be removed uh, or at least mis displaced 
momentarily so that the plaque can be sewn to where it needs to be. And the patient is in the hospital for this. This is our only inpatient procedure that we have. And they're in the hospital for four days. The plaque is, is put on day one. Um, on day three, it's removed. And we keep them in the hospital for one more day. And typically, that's Tuesday, the plaque goes on. Friday, the plaque goes off. And then Saturday, they go home. And here's a picture of a plaque. And this is the outside of the plaque. This is going on on the patient's eye. Here it is. It's all gold. It looks huge. I think this is a 22 millimeter one. This is, I think, as big as it gets. And I have a little video here. We're not going to watch the entire video, but we'll we'll watch a little bit of it. This is Dr. Murray putting on the, the plaque. Now, they've already measured with an ultrasound where the plaque is going to go, and there are little marks there. They've also already attached um, some threads to, to the extraocular muscles so they can move the eye around kind of like a little puppet. I don't know if you guys can hear the music playing, but Dead or Alive is playing in the background. No, the patient, no, your eyeball out. The, the patient is awake. They're in twilight right now. They have propofol and they're blocked, so they can't move. They can't do anything. And Tim was just talking to the patient. He was telling them that he wasn't taking their eyeball out. And, and Tim came out with a paper a number of years ago talking about the success rate of this surgery, the more years you've been doing the surgery. And he has virtually a 100% success rate. You know, there, there have been, an, uh, I, I can't think of, I've been working with him for, for over 15 years, and I can't think of an instance where we did breaking therapy to a lesion that wasn't enormous, that, that didn't have local tumor control. There was maybe one or two where he would tell the patient beforehand, hey, this tumor is 18 millimeters wide. I can try the breaking therapy if you want to go through it, um, but I can't guarantee that, that it, will, it will kill all the tumor. And if it doesn't, we can't redo the breaking therapy. We have to take the eye out. That's only happened in 15 years. I, I think that's happened maybe twice. Okay. So most of the time, this is this is a successful procedure. And, and the studies have shown that it's as effective as enucleation in um, metastasis. But we can have other issues happening with this, namely radiation retinopathy. You can also have damage to the optic disc, radiation optic neuropathy. Cataract formation is, is common. Vitreous hem hemorrhage is, is not uncommon. Exudative retinal detachment, now that we have OCT, we can see you know, just the, the smallest subretinal fluid or intraretinal edema. And then what we don't want is neovascular glaucoma because that usually leads to a blind, painful eye. Before we had the treatments we have today that I'll be talking about, that was about one out of 12 times they would still have to have their eye removed because of neovascular glaucoma. One um, complication I didn't mention here is diplopia. Uh, if Dr. Murray does have to move a muscle, he'll put it back after he takes the plaque out, but they can have up to six months of diplopia. And if they have, if they have double vision beyond six months, we'll usually have them see a strap surgeon like Dr. Craig McEwen at Bascom Palmer. And they usually, the, Dr. McEwen is amazing. He'll, he'll only operate on the eye that had the muscle removed, the muscle moved. And he does a very good job of, of um, at least straightening the eye out in central gaze. Here's an example of radiation retinopathy. Treated tumor. This patient was treated many years ago. He swears he never had laser. This, these look like laser marks, but this could be just from the radiation, from the plaque. Um, you can see hemorrhaging here, here. You can see cotton wool spots here. There may be some subretinal fluid here. The nerve looks a little pale. This is kind of the classic radiation retinopathy. When this particular picture was taken, this was back at Bascom Palmer. Um, I, I just saw this patient the other day, last week and he's doing great, but this was taken at Bascom Palmer and the ophthalmic um, photographer had the patient look up. He used a swab to kind of hold the eyelid up. And when the patient looked up, he created a vitreous hemorrhage. So, I mean, this, this is kind of everything with radiation retinopathy. What did the ophthalmic photographer do? Well, he did what any good ophthalmic photographer would do and he took more pictures. And this eventually resolved. This patient actually lives in West Virginia. He sees us, yeah, I think three or four times a year, every every three or four months. And we'll 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 treat him with anti-VEGF. Um, he knows when he gets a vitreous hemorrhage. His vision is good enough to to appreciate a vitreous hemorrhage. He's a, he happens to be a lawyer. He's very kind of aware of what's going on with an eye that you would think would just be suppressed. Um, so he keeps us up to date too. Here's another example. This is. 
a complex retinal detachment. Here's the treated tumor here. You have this tractional retinal detachment, but there's also an exudative retinal detachment here. So for, in this case, um, Dr. Murray wound up taking the patient to the OR. He had to do membrane peel. He did a pars plan of vitrectomy. Um, he did do some more endolaser, and then he did an air fluid exchange with some gas insertion. And here's probably two or at least three weeks after. This is probably the one month because you can still see bubble here. Um, after surgery, patient was face down for a week, but their macula looks looks phenomenal. And and what we're seeing now is radiation retinopathy used to be used to be thought of oh well it probably comes around you know a year and a half eighteen months it'll start showing up. Well with OCT now we see that it's it's much sooner than that. We'll see it within the first year for most patients. Um, uh, you know in the form of of retinal edema or subretinal fluid, even if there isn't significant hemorrhaging. In the collaborative ocular melanoma study, the vision was 2200 three years after brachytherapy. That is not necessarily the case now. Um, we used to have, there was a radiation oncologist that would see the patients before they had their brachytherapy, um, Arnie Marco, he's passed away, unfortunately, but he used to tell patients that, oh yeah, you're going to go blind in this eye eventually. And that's, it, that may have been true in the past. It didn't happen all the time, but, but, you know, three-year rate of having 2200 vision isn't great. Nowadays, we can keep the vision if um, the nerve isn't affected, really. So how do we do that? Well, anti-VEGF and, and um, steroid injections. And, and this is the list of stuff we've been using. We have been using um, um, the Bismo, Farizumab, we were using Bay of View before there was the occlusive, the, the vasculitis event. We stopped using Bay of View, but we never had that event. Um, Frisimab works, works pretty well too. Um, we had a nice study that compared Avastin, um, Avastin with triamcinolone, with triessence versus Ilea alone. Both had really good results. Right now, um, triessence isn't on the market, but what we've been doing is periorbital subtenons um, uh, Kenalog injections. And they're, they're not as effective as the triessence, but they're still very effective at treating um, radiation retinopathy. So I have just a couple of quick cases that I'll show you. Here's a 57-year-old white woman um, that had brachytherapy six months ago, and she starts to present with a little bit of edema. And we inject one injection of Avastin six weeks later. Now, you know, we could hold an injection or we could do another injection and bring her back in eight weeks. Tim is very aggressive at injecting. And if he thinks that there's even a microscopic amount of, of macular edema, he'll inject and then he'll stretch. We do a, a treat and adjust. Here's another case, also 57, but this is 18 months later. This patient had subretinal fluid. We did an Avastin injection. She didn't come back for 10 weeks. So we shortened that interval, treat and adjust. Eight weeks afterwards, there's still fluid, but it's much better than the, the previous visit. And here's one more case, 70-year-old uh, female with, with radiation retinopathy 19 months later. This actually looks good. It's actually neovascularization around here, around the, the, the treated area. That's why we did the Avastin injection. 12 weeks later, she actually had, had fluid inside the retina, some macular edema, cystoid macular edema, and a little subretinal fluid too. When we see this kind of macular edema from radiation retinopathy, yes, it can be vascular, it could also have an inflammatory component. We could do an FA to see if, if there's truly a, a vascular versus inflammatory component, but it doesn't change the way we treat. So we injected with triessence at the time. Eight weeks later, it looked like it was never there. Back to 2030 here, better than before. So this is how we control the radiation inside, the radiation damage inside of the eye. But what about the rest of the body? Well, we do. We want to, the patient to have a metastatic screening. We usually don't order the the liver function panel or the um, abdominal MRI. We'll excuse me. We'll usually have um, a medical oncologist do it, or their their medical doctor if they're comfortable. Um, if the medical doctor is comfortable ordering those tests. More recently, we've been employing um, different types of genomic testing, and we'll we'll talk really about the gene expression profiling is the important one. The suppression subtractive hybridization was showing downregulation of a specific gene in melanoma mm -hmm. that's associated with metastasis. It's called the EDNRB gene. And the MLPA was showing genes that, that it was testing 31 genes on chromosome 1, 3, 6, and 8, but it wasn't correlating that with metastasis. Gene expression profiling does. Gene expression profiling 
basically, let's go to the next slide. It assesses 15 genes on chromosome three and eight. And basically, depending on the signature, the genetic signature you get, which, which mutations you have, you are either in a class one or class two. And class one is associated with a much less aggressive melanoma versus class two, which has been associated with a very aggressive. And when I say aggressive, I mean very high chance of metastasis, even if no metastasis is seen on abdominal imaging. So Aaron, just to clarify, you are taking a needle biopsy of these tumors? Yes. So, so yes, this is a fine needle aspiration biopsy. This, this and, isn't like swabbing someone's mouth no, and sending I, it off to, I, right? I, you're, I, bi you're biopsying, the, you're, you're, you're doing the, the tumor. That's exactly right. I wish it could just be a blood test or, or a swab, but this is actually looking at the genetics of that tumor. So far, I've talked about what I've talked about has been a transscleral route of the fine needle aspiration biopsy. So what will happen is um, Dr. Murray will do the fine needle aspiration biopsy, put the plaque on, kill the tumor. The, we, we will also talk about a transvitreal route in just a little bit. Um, because we're we're doing more things with this. So so basically what this is doing is it's saying, hey, you have a really high chance of this tumor to have spread, or hey, you have a really low chance of this tumor to have spread. The problem is up until recently, why does that matter? You know? So so moving back a little bit, these are the genes that it's it's looking at. It's really looking at 12 genes. There are three control genes. And here is the the and, and the only reason I wanted to clarify that because there's you know genetic testing out there for glaucoma now, keratoconus, macular degeneration, which yes. we can do in the office in their office, you know, their mouth swabs and so spitting into tubes and so on and so forth. I wanted the audience to realize that you're literally taking a piece of the tumor, sending it out, and this yes. is what's giving you that information. So thank you for clarifying that. Of course, my, my pleasure. And remember, the originally I'd mentioned we were afraid to do that because we were afraid of a seating event inside the eye. When we do the fine needle aspiration biopsy, we're, we're not just doing the biopsy, we're treating it immediately afterwards. Um, and there has not been seeding events. I'm knocking on wood while I say that, okay? Um, here's, here's the results of class one versus class two. Class one is subdivided into class uh, 1A and 1B. And you can see a class 1A has a very, very low chance of metastasis. A class two has an incredibly high chance of metastasis. In fact, only 28% are metastasis free in five years. Okay, so that means 72% of patients have a metastasis. And in the past, that just meant death. That was synonymous with death. Um, not, not so much anymore because of what we're, we're talking about. So, so in the past, before we had any other treatments, okay, that's bad information. You know, if you have a class two, but what can we do about it? Do we just watch you more often? Do we do more PET scans? You know, that's more radiation. That's going to that's gonna be even worse. Well, now we have other treatments. And the argument is, should we treat those patients with some kind of adjunct systemic therapy before metastasis is seen? Remember, when these things met, they met microscopically. These are microscopic metastases. And if we start treating this patient with something that's not super dangerous, that, that you know, everything's risk first benefit, um, does that have a higher chance of keeping them alive? And, and we don't do that. We actually are sending them to specific uh, medical oncologists that handle specifically metastatic choroidal melanoma. Um, Dr. Sato is in Philadelphia. He's at Jefferson University. He works with the Shields Otho. And he he's, if we can, if if our patients have a class two tumor, if they will go to Philadelphia, remember I'm in Miami. If they are willing to travel to Philadelphia to see Dr. Sato, he's our number one person to see. Okay. And sometimes he'll do, he'll work with a local oncologist, but but usually he has to see the patient, I think one time. Um, before he can do any kind of co-management. And I don't know what he's been doing recently. The, the last big thing was the Kimtrak was the FDA approved immunotherapy. You can see that actually right here. We, we were talking about valproic acid and Uruvoy Obdivo combinations. Um, each one has worked a little better than, than the last, but so far Kimtrak is, is the new thing, okay? Um, and, and Dr. Sato may be employing some, some other techniques also. Our mortality rate, I think Tim just published it, for class two patients was very low. It was much lower um, than, than the 72% um, suggestion uh, from, from the original gene expression profiling, okay? And we still, we still have class one patients followed. We don't ignore class one. Even, you know, 98% is not 100%. We still, what we suggest are, are MRIs. We don't want PET scans if they don't need to have PET scans. So we still suggest, uh, you know, abdominal MRIs and the, the uh, liver panel and the blood work, okay? And that, all of that brings me to this patient that I like to talk about. This is the only slide in the lecture 
that doesn't have a picture that I took that that our office took. This was a, a picture that was taken at a local optometrist's office. I don't even know the name of the optometrist that took this picture. This is an old optos. Um, this patient was complaining about uh, decreased vision. Her vision, I think it was was something like 2040 or 2050. She went in, he took this picture, he refracted her, he got her back to 2020, and he sent her on her way. The notes didn't mention this lesion. It didn't have an interpretation um, at all of the optos, and then in the fundus evaluation, it didn't mention the lesion. Patient lost vision several months later. She went to a general ophthalmologist instead of that optometrist. That general ophthalmologist saw subretinal fluid, and he sent her to us. The lesion is 1.8 millimeters. So you have a 1.8 millimeter lesion with subretinal fluid. Dr. Murray said, I think this is an atypical nevus. Let's inject this with Avastin and see how you do. The patient said, well, before I do that, can I get a second opinion? We said, sure. We had left Bascom Palmer and Dr. Harbour was at Bascom Palmer at the time who, uh, Bill Harbour was the one that actually developed gene expression profiling. Um, he saw the patient and he said, yeah, I think, I think it's a small nevus or a, a, a large nevus, an atypical nevus, um, not a melanoma. But uh, instead of a vastin injection, let's do TTT. Let's do trans uh, pupillary thermotherapy. And the patient said, well, now I'm getting two different, two different treatments. I'm going to get a tiebreaker. So um, she went up to see, at the time, this was about 10 years ago. So she went up to see um, the Shields when Jerry was still practicing with Carol at the Shields. And Jerry saw her and he said, you know what? I think you got a melanoma, small melanoma. I, I want to plaque you. I want to do a brachytherapy. So, so now she had three different famous, good ocular oncologists with two different diagnoses with three different treatments. She came back down to see us. And at this point, it was about three months. And, and three months is, is really when we like to re-measure uh, these lesions with ultrasound. We like to, to, to give it a, at least 90 days. If you can see in our office, 0.4 millimeters is a statistically significant change um, um, in, in the lesion. And if it's changes more than 0.4 milliliter, millimeters in three months, then, then you have a transformation, um, or very likely a transformation. It was still 1.8 millimeters. It would have been an easy answer if it, if it had transformed, had shown transformation. I remember we'd only seen this patient, you know, over the course of a few months. Um, but Dr. Murray said, well, here's what I can do. You've, you've got a cataract also anyway. Um, I can take you to surgery. I can take care of the cataract. And while I do that, I'll do a combined surgery, anterior, posterior. I will laser ablate this lesion and get genetic information um, using the uh, fine needle aspiration biopsy, basically doing GEP. And that's what he did. And it turns out it had a class. Now, remember, these, these genetics are not used to diagnose melanoma, but it so happens that the, this lesion had a class of 1B. So it wasn't a, a, a just a typical nevus, probably. And it was good that, that she did that. Now, of course, there was a complication. She had a retinal detachment. He had to bring her back to surgery. He put gas in her eye. She wound up with 20-30 vision, um, and she's very happy now, except... Um, recently, she's developed lung cancer. It has nothing to do with the melanoma. It's not a, from a, it's not a metastasis. It's an adenocarcinoma. It's unrelated. You wonder if there's some kind of underlying um, genetics that have some commonality with with these tumors. So we've been doing that for for lesions that are not quite melanoma. Basically, someone I've heard a, a doctor call them nevomas. Basically, it's it's, it's right in between melanoma nevus. If we see the beginning of transformation and they're less than three millimeters, or if we're going into the eye for another reason, if, if the patient's had a stable atypical lesion that has subretinal fluid that's been getting injections for years for, for, for coronal neovascular membranes associated with their lesion, but not transformational lesion, if we're going to go in the eye anyway, we'll get gene expression profiling. And we'll do that, not transscleral, we'll do that transvitreous. And I have a couple cases of that. Um, Here's a patient that had a tumor that was 1.9 millimeters, atypical, um, uh, uh, nevus versus a small melanoma. And Tim did a pars plantar vitrectomy, membrane peel, endolaser. He also did phaco I I IOL. He injected triessence in the eye at the end of it, and he did a fine needle aspiration biopsy. He does the fine needle aspiration biopsy right before the endolaser, and I have an OCT scan. And actually, we, we published this picture because it was the first time you've seen, we, we, there was a picture of a fine needle aspiration biopsy on OCT. And there's the incision site right here. And you can see this is one day after surgery. So the patient has subretinal fluid, intra, intra um, retinal edema. Um, they actually did very, very well. And here's another patient similar. 
1.8 millimeters. And their vision was, was actually very poor. You can see that there's fluid right in the center here. The, the lesion comes right up to the center. Tim can't laser ablate everything around here or else the patient will be blind, but he can go right around it and then he can, he can laser ablate over where he does the fine needle aspiration biopsy. Both of these patients were class 1As. They, they were not dangerous lesions. And the patient did well with that. And we're doing more of that. We're, we're, we are getting every now and then a surprise, a class 2. And what do you do when you have a class 2? Should you do more treatment? Is a laser ablation enough? Or should they go and, and have brachytherapy? And that's the conversation we're having now. But this is all kind of new territory. Um, just interesting. That is a plug of triessence right there, we think. So before I leave melanoma, um, I've been talking nothing about um, um, non-choroidal. The, there's other uveal tissue, right? There's ciliary body and there's iris. Let's, let's show you an example of a patient, nice guy. He saw us when he was, I think he was 22 at the time, he was young. Can everyone see this little spot here? Mm -hmm. On ultrasound biomicroscopy, this was less than uh, one and a half millimeters. I think it was just around one millimeters in thickness. So we told the patient, come back in three months and we're going to recheck it. He heard three years. And this is what it looked like three years later. A very large lesion. If you can't see it, here's transillumination. That might help. He was plaqued. You can put the plaque right over the cornea in this case. And after we plaqued him, he had quite the response. So he has kind of this uveitic <laughs> response, right? Oh, let's go, in, let's go back here. Someone asked me last time I gave this lecture, are these sentinel vessels? I think so. Um, it's hard to tell, right? You can't, you, you can't be sure. Um, definitely more vascular over on this area than, than this area, right? Um, this, this, this is probably sentinel vasculature right here, okay? Um, here, I'm not sure. The patient should have come back in three months. Now that said, he was treated. He had a tumor necrosis event that really scarred his his um, his lens. He's a young guy. That's you know he's, he was phakic. Um, we were injecting every six weeks. He was living in Orlando at the time. He was coming down every six weeks, and we were injecting him for like six months. And he had hand motion to to light perception in this eye. Eventually, Tim thought the eye was quiet enough to do surgery to do cataract surgery. 2025 after cataract surgery. Not the prettiest eye in the world, but but a, a good seeing eye with with a rather large um, ciliary body melanoma. Here's a nice example of an iris melanoma, and you can kind of see the cross section of the of the vasculature with this. Here's a gonio version of it. And then this lesion was a four. I just saw her the other day. Um, 14 year old girl that presented with this lesion, a melanotic. You can see that there's something going on here too, right? Satellite lesions. And Dr. Murray had, he, he did buy it. Since there's already spread of this lesion, he biopsied it. He sent it out to Dr. Debovi at Bascom Palmer, the pathologist. Dr. Debovi said, that's a melanoma. And Dr. Murray wanted him to, to recheck. And he was, it was, you know, he's a very famous pathologist. He was actually, it sounded like he was um, insulted by the insinuation that he was wrong, but he rechecked because she's a 14 year old kid with a melanoma and, and the treatment unfortunately was to take the eye out. There was already this, these satellite lesions. This is called tapioca melanoma of the iris. And up until recently, I would say that that was the only treatment. Um, we did have a patient that came from Dr. Gregudis's office that didn't have satellites, but still had this amelanotic lesion. It was It's smaller than this that has been watched for like 14 years. So because the lesion had been watched for 14 years, we're watching it now. We're not seeing any satellite lesions. It's amelanotic. So you can have, you know, what, what I would call tapioca um, nevus of the iris too. I think, I, I don't know if it's been reported on, but but I know of at least one case where, where there was that. And I mentioned, I've been mentioning ultrasound biomicroscopy, the, the high-res ultrasound, and, and this is it. And this is just an example of that tapioca melanoma of the iris. You can see the lesion here. You can see it right in the angle also. Um, you know, I really should have a video of ultrasound um, because it's a dynamic test, right? It's, it's, it's not static. You can't just take some pictures and then send it out. And, and when we talk about reproducibility of the ultrasound, we're talking about someone that knows what they're doing that's getting a perfect 90 degree angle going into these lesions so that it's not an oblique angle and giving an artificially higher um, apical height of these lesions.
here's a gonial of that of that lesion too. And I think we're done with with the melanoma section of of the lecture. Half the lecture was melanoma. We have a polling question here. Which of the following is not clinical risk for uveal melanoma? Uh, drusen present over the lesion, orange pigmentation present over the lesion, subretinal fluid surrounding the lesion, or the lesion thickness of five millimeters. Okay, so the question is open. If you're having a tough time seeing it on the right side of your screen, uh, there's a button that says polls, just kind of like we did earlier. And uh, I see people have found it now because responses are rolling in. Um, as a reminder, you can put questions into the chat box. Um, and Joe, do you want to take a look at the the questions while I watch the poll? I see something's there, but I want to watch the poll. Yeah, so there are a couple a uh, couple comments uh, about not being a happy and uh, being happy ending. It's too benign uh, name for melanoma. But a good question: Do you have a recall system in place, or how do you prevent months from becoming years? to the uh, terminally confused out there, patients yeah. that is. We're, we're still working on that. You know, we get patients that complain to us that we annoy them too much with, with reminders, with email reminders and calls. I had a patient that was really upset that we kept emailing him um, a reminder for his appointment. And I'm like, look, I, you know, especially in our clinic of, of all the clinics, you know, we're, we'd rather remind you more than less. We, we can't drag you to the office. Um, we have had patients that were lost to follow up that that bad things have happened. Um, we had one patient that wasn't our patient that came after they were diagnosed by a, a good ocular oncologist two years before of melanoma, and they decided to do um, some other homeopathic treatment that that did not work. When they saw us, the tumor was so big that we did have to take her eye out, unfortunately. So it happens, you know. I have right. another I polling to... question. Yep, hold on. Let me take care of this one here. Sure, I'm going to sure, display sure. it. Sure thing. I'll close it. And we had 95% of the audience say Drusen Ooh, present yeah. over the lesion. That is correct. All right. And one more for now. Uh, the okay. most common site in the body for metastasis of uveal melanoma. The brain and the liver, the liver and the lungs, the kidneys and the liver, the brain and the lungs. Okay. Question is open. People know where to find it. Remember, this is what makes the course uh, synchronous virtual. This means you're participating. This is being tracked. This helps us allow us to give you the credit. So try to answer the questions. The most common site in the body for metastasis of the uveal melanoma is the brain to liver, the, the liver to lung, liver and lungs, the brain and liver, the liver and lungs, the kidneys and liver, the brain and lungs. And it looks like we've got a pretty good audience tonight here. Yeah, we've good. got, uh, I'll display the results real quick. We have 8% saying brain and liver. We have 82% going with liver and lungs, kidney and liver at 4%, and uh, brain and lungs at 4%. Well, I'll tell you, for that one, I, I don't blame you for, for thinking brain. Most of our patients are concerned about their brains. Um, they typically, it's, it's a vascular route. It tends to go to the liver first, then the lungs. Um, the brain is almost never involved, involved. There was one patient that I remember had, had an, an issue with brain cancer, I think she had a glioblastoma that was not a metastasis from the melanoma. Um, the doctors described it as that. Unfortunately, the patient passed away, um, and I don't think they ever did an autopsy to to see what the what the lesion was. But um, um, typically, typically, melanoma doesn't go to the brain. If it's in the brain, then it's probably everywhere else. Unfortunately, and, and you know, nowadays with immunotherapy, you have people staying alive that may have some some atypical metastases of, of lesions if they're not completely under control, but typically liver and lungs, okay? So so I know I said we're, we're done with melanoma. This looks like a melanoma, like an amelanotic melanoma. This is, we have a lesion here in the left eye, nice clear view in the left eye, maybe not perfectly clear, maybe a little elevated over the lesion here. It is a choroidal lesion, it is amelanotic. Um, what would make me think that, that this is something else besides 
a, a atypical nevus versus an atypical amelanotic melanoma? Well, let's look at the other eye. That's not right. That's not normal, right? Huge, multi-lobulated, amelanotic, mostly lesion. There are some patchy pigment areas here. There's some areas of what we call leopard spotting, some, some hyperplastic changes here. This is a MET. These are choroidal metastases. And choroidal metastasis is the most common intraocular malignancy. Notice I didn't say primary. This is not a primary. This is a, a cancer that's coming from somewhere else in the body. And 88% of the time, it winds up in um, the choroid of the uveal, of the uveal tissue. And, and you wonder why that is. I, I, my theory is the choroid is one of the most vascular tissues in the human body. And if there's a vascular route for, for metastases, that's probably where it will end up. You know, the, you, you've got other parts of the uvea, the ciliary body and the iris are vascular too, but, but they have pigment in them. The choroid can have pigment, but it's a very, very vascular layer. It's, it's meant to, you know, feed it other parts of the retina, as you know, and it's, you know, um, I think just where a lot of these, these tumors wind up. Unlike melanoma, these lesions have a moderate to high internal acoustic reflectivity on the A scans of the ultrasound. I'm going to show you an example of that in the next slide. And these can come from anywhere. The most common places they come from, breasts in women and lung from men, but they, I've seen them from almost any other organ in the body. Okay. Here's an example of an A scan through this lesion. We have the, the front of the eye, the vitreous, the retinal spike. Here is the lesion. This is disorganized. It's moderate. It has some, some high internal acoustic reflectivity. It's not uniform. I mentioned the melanomas tend to be uniform. They're, they're primary lesions. They're multiplying right in that area. These have spread to the area that, you know, they may not be functioning the way they're supposed to. I have a really nice example of, of that coming up. They tend to be much more disorganized. Also, you notice they weren't weren't very dome shaped. Um, they can kind of be multi lobulated. They can grow very fast too, depending on what the underlying cancer is. So here's just a nice comparison. This is the MET. Here's primary melanoma. Totally different looks on ultrasound, and 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 we do besides the clinical exam, the ultrasound is is really the most important ancillary test in an ocular oncology office. Okay. Here's a B scan. Again, not really dome shaped. You kind of got this generalized thickening of the choroid. Nice funnel detachment here. This eye isn't doing great. Here's an optos of another lesion. This patient had lung cancer, kind of leopard spotting here. Remember, the optos is using red and green laser. It's not really using white light, so so the color may be a little off. But in general, this is this is pretty good. Here, here's the, the, we're using the silver stone, so here's an OCT of the same eye, and you can see the lesion just goes straight up. It's it's thick. Here's the other eye of that of that patient. Um, again, nice leopard spotting here. We think there's some subretinal fluid here. I'm going to show you some subretinal fluid here. I mentioned we've been doing fundus autofluorescence. Here it's kind of diffuse. It's hard to see the edges, at least on on optos here. Fundus autofluorescence. I think things come come into play. You can see the the um, leopard spotting hyperflore or autofluoresces um, nicely there. And then again, the OCTs show some subretinal fluid in the macula. Here's the, here's the foveola right here. And here's the, an inferior cut here. What's kind of um, interesting here is that you actually have a posterior face of the OCT. The reason we don't use OCT so much to measure um, choroidal lesions isn't because they're so big, although a big choroidal lesion can't can't get through the entire scan of the OCT. But usually, it's because of the pigmentation. Pigmentation will cause um, uh, basically blocking. Um, when you have an amelanotic lesion, light gets through it, and you actually can see the posterior face of the lesion on the OCT. So it's it's interesting. It doesn't it doesn't help clinically. This helps clinically because this will tell us if they're getting other treatments. Maybe we can do. Um, um, some supplemental anti-VEGF. If they're in the middle of external beam radiotherapy, maybe we don't want to do um, some retinal we, um, injections for the subretinal fluid. We'll wait until their their primary treatment is over. Speaking of treatment, EBRT is usually the, the go-to for these. They're diffuse. They're, they're both eyes. We'll do external beam radiotherapy. And that's usually a number of sessions, around 18 sessions over the course of three weeks, um, where they just keep, every weekday, they keep going back and they get 
radiation kind of beamed right into their eyes. Um, you can also do plaque brachytherapy if these are small or isolated. And then sometimes you can do um, TTT for very small lesions. Sometimes they're getting chemo for, for everything else going on. And I should add immunotherapy also for other things going on and will actually hold. That's why observation, that's one of the reasons observation is there. Um, if they're receiving systemic therapy for, for uh, metastasis all over their body. The other reason for observation being there is if they're in, you know, the last weeks of their life and they're not having a vision problem, we don't want to make their life harder at the end. You know, it's, it's a tough conversation to have at that, at that point. And then um, Tim has had two cases before. He's been doing this since the 90s and I started working with him in 2008. So I didn't see these cases, but he's mentioned two times he's had ruptured globes from, both times were from metastasis. So they grow faster than the melanoma. The melanoma, you, I, I showed you some examples of extraocular extension. Um, apparently metastasis can sometimes be much more, much quicker. And if that's the case, the eye has to come. I mentioned... Um, a case that had the, the the metastatic cells were acting a little funny. This is a patient that had esophageal melanoma. And at this point, here's a tumor in the right eye. Here's a tumor in the left eye way over here. You can see adjacent subretinal fluid associated with both of them. When we have subretinal fluid associated with any of these lesions, we think it's a, a type of CMV. Um, even if it's not so apparent on fluorescein angiography, there can be some very, very, very slow leakage. But, was there a question? I thought I heard something. No? Okay. I'll keep going. Anyway, this patient was treated with, um, this patient has it has amelanotic esophageal melanoma. So even though they're, it's a melanoma from the esophagus, the cells aren't even doing what they're supposed to be doing anymore. It's, it's you know, they're not even pigmented cells. Um, this patient was treated with external beam radiotherapy and their eye did fantastic. Unfortunately, um, the rest of their body didn't and they wound up passing away. So that's, that's, you know, where we'll leave it for um, metastatic lesions in the eye. And, and that's the most common. If you're, you know, in a primary setting, the most common lesion you'll see that's cancer in the eye is actually something from somewhere else. So where is it coming from? That polling question is now open. Um... That might not be the question. Let me see if I can find it. There we go. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like the previous question. Sorry about that. Sneaky. We got the questions rolling in now, or the answers rolling in. Excellent. So that, does anyone have any questions otherwise? We're, we're, this is the end of the, um, the uvea. We're going to move on to the retina after this. I'll check it real quick. No, we're caught up. Beautiful. Most common primary neoplasm sites for choroidal metastasis include, and we have the breast and lungs, the brain and spleen, the adrenal glands and liver, and the ears and nose. We got people rolling in here. I'm going to show it and display it. And we have 96 saying breast and lungs. Oh, excellent. Very good. This, this is one of those cases where, you know, the worst not the, I, I would say the worst primary brain cancer to have is glioblastoma. And that almost never spreads to other parts of the body. You know, glioblastoma destroys the brain. Um, but that's, that, that stays put. Otherwise I've seen it from everywhere, but definitely breast and lungs are the, are the most common. So let's move on. Let's move on to the retina and we'll start with the big one in the retina. So we have a nice view into, this is the right eye and this nice large nasal retinal lesion. And we can tell that it's a retinal lesion because the retinal vasculature is going right through it. And in fact, 
this is probably an endophytic lesion, meaning it's coming into the vitreous from the retina, from, from you know, the outer sensory retina. I'm sorry, the inner sensory retina. Um, and this is a retinoblastoma. And it's the most common primary intraocular malignancy in, in children. It affects one out of 5,000 births, live births. Remember, this is a mutation of the RB1 um, uh, tumor su suppressor gene. And I believe, I, I may be corrected, but I believe that was the first gene that was actually mapped, the, the, the genome that was mapped. I think it was the RB1 uh, gene that was mapped. Um, so these can be autosomal dominant or they could be de novo. They can be just a, a, a mutation and it can be um, a sequencing mutation or an addition deletion mutation of the gene that can cause this, okay? And the current treatment, you know, I have here chemotherapy, laser, radiotherapy, and enucleation. One of those things really should be removed at least um, in, in the world right now, that's the radiotherapy. You know, you really don't wanna do radiation on, on babies. And there's a couple reasons. The biggest reason is if you do radiation, you have a high chance of a secondary brain tumor later in their life. Remember, you're doing external beam radiotherapy on a developing head. You have a high chance of, of later in their life having, having cancer. Um, the other thing is cosmetic. When you do EBRT, I don't know if anybody's noticed somebody with retinoblastoma has, if they excuse me, had both eyes radiated, they usually have a very, very sunken in orbit with a very small PD, unusually small PD. That's because they've stunted the the, the growth of the bone, of the orbit. Um, and, and there's some facial de deformities from it. Um, you know, so, so because of those reasons, we like to do chemotherapy, usually sandwiched with laser. I'm going to go over all of that in just a second. Um, traditionally though, these tumors have not responded well when they're very advanced. And we're going to talk about advanced tumors. More recently, there are some new techniques of employing the chemotherapy. And I have a, one of my favorite videos that I'm going to show you guys of that. So presenting signs, by and large, leukocoria, the white reflex. Um, you can also um, pick something up from, from a, a baby with strabismus or red painful eye or the pediatrician, notice the pediatrician, only 3% of those well baby examinations show them the, the retinoblastoma. By and large, it's leukocoria. You know, I don't know now with digital cameras if they're gonna take out kinds of, I know they take the red light out, will there be a, a, a correction for, for a white reflex? Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's that's going to be an issue going forward, but let's, let's see some examples of leukocoria. So here's leukocoria, here is leukocoria. Here is leukocoria, and yes, this is leukocoria too. And I know what everyone's thinking. Um, no, the dog does not have retinoblastoma. What happened was the dog had cataracts in both eyes and had the right eye cataract surgery. The problem was when the parents saw this picture, they saw the white reflex here and they thought, eh, not a big deal. The dog has a white reflex too. And that delayed the, the diagnosis of retinoblastoma. We mentioned the staging. We mentioned we mentioned um, advanced, um, not favorable um, prognoses. First, let's talk about mortality rate is usually very low. It's it's supposed to be five percent worldwide. Um, my so so my oncologist Tim had a zero percent mortality rate for thirty years with retinoblastoma, and then he had two patients die within two weeks of each other. One of them had a pineoblastoma, um, also called tertiary retinoblastoma. The pineal gland can sometimes have retinoblastoma. And if they do, there's not a lot you can do about it. And then there, there was another patient that had somehow a metastasis of the retinoblastoma, even though they were getting systemic chemotherapy to the brain and, um, and they passed away. Um, and it's tough because these are children. This is, you know, this is, it's tough when anybody passes away, but especially hits hard um, when it's a child that, that, you know, I remember Tim saying to patients um, years ago, oh, I'm going to cure this. I'm, you know, this is, there's a 100% chance they'll, they'll stay alive. Now, unfortunately, he, he doesn't say that. And it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's terrible. It's terrible because this is, this is a tough cancer if it, if it, if it is huge and it gets away from you. So here's the, here's the old staging. 
Um, and typically, I'm not going to go through every one of these, but typically the smaller the lesion is, the closer the lesion is posteriorly, um, the more favorable the outcome is in eye preservation. So what I'm talking about here in, in favorable and unfavorable is, is not mortality rate, it's to preserve the eye. The larger the tumor is, the more tumors there are, and the, the farther it goes towards the front of the eye presents with an unfavorable um, outcome for the eye. So group four, for example, multiple tumors larger than 10 disc diameters or any tumor extending towards the front of the eye um, past the aura serrata, that's, that's a stage 4A and a stage 4B, they have an unfavorable, there's a high chance of losing the eye. The treatment won't be effective. Group five can show vitreous seeding into the vitreous. It can show tumors that are that are actually in the anterior seg. It can show as a pseudohypopia, and I have an example of that. There's newer staging, but it's it's still the same gist. Um, group A has has three small, tiny tumors. As the tumors get bigger or farther in the front of the eye through either vitreous seeding or subretinal fluid, um, the the group is higher. It's it has uh, a, a a poor prognosis. Okay. So here's an early intraretinal retinoblastoma. You can see there's some vascularity associated with this lesion. This lesion may be small enough if they're, if they're you know, I don't have an exact size for you, but if, they're, if the thickness is less than a millimeter, Dr. Murray may be able to laser ablate this lesion without even employing chemotherapy if this is the only eye involved. There may be some calcification associated with this on ultrasound. Um, uh, they, they, you see calcification as very high um, uh, acoustic internal reflectivity that, that causes something called an acoustic echo sometimes. It's such high internal reflectivity. This is also a relatively early lesion, but it's right in the macula, and it's, it's a great example of, of um, high vascularity for retinoblastoma. I showed this leukocoria before, um, and you can see the lesion is large and, and in the macula. What's in, in a way more important is this is bilateral. This is a small lesion. And you can argue that it's much more important to treat this lesion now with laser to preserve 2020 vision. This eye is already going to have poor vision. And here's an endophytic lesion over the optic nerve. Um, these are more advanced. And then these are very advanced. You know, you have a large tumor mass here that in this case, there's lots of vitreous seeding, and then you can have some other things that we we talked about for for these more advanced um, retinoblastomas. Now, it's now the point of treatment for these with with chemotherapy is to debulk the lesion so that you can then laser the lesion. And you can imagine it's easier to do that when they're stationary in the retina than when they're kind of everywhere, right? Here's some extensive vitreous seeding again. Here's a pseudohypopion. Here and here, with the, basically it's anterior segment seed. And here it's it's causing the eye to be an angry eye. It's it has an inflammatory response and a vascular response uh, with with the um, neovascularization of the iris and the hyphema. And and you know the 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 management course is number one to keep the patient alive. Number two to keep the eyeball in the in the head if possible. And then number three to decrease vision problems. I mentioned the chemotherapy is used to debulk the lesion. So they get cycles of chemotherapy. How do they get the chemotherapy? Well, there's different ways, but let's talk about systemic chemotherapy first. Um, systemic chemotherapy can be done with uh, a number of different um, chemotherapy agents. They tend to have six to nine cycles of chemotherapy every three to four weeks. So they'll do a cycle of chemo, um, systemically, then they'll be brought to the operating room with Tim for an exam under anesthesia, and he'll laser ablate after the chemo each time. That does a, a good job of decreasing the actual bulk of the lesion and then keeping local tumor control, basically killing it. Usually, after three sessions, half of it is, is done, and it will take however many sessions it takes. So it can take up to up to nine cycles. It's very it's very effective um, if the lesions are not in the vitreous or in the anterior seg. And this is just what we talked about, basically synergistic interaction. They use the chemo first, and then they do the laser in the E way. Here is an example of 
those cycles for four months. So four to five cycles. And you can see this lesion is much smaller now. Here's more of a stepped process. So this is the original lesion. This is two cycles afterwards, so, so one to two months, around two months after, maybe six to eight weeks after, four cycles, and then six cycles. Visual acuity is 2060. One of the doctors, when, when Tim was presenting this, said that that can't be 2060. That's, that's, you know, if this is the right eye and this is the macula, then that's impossible. The patient's using their other eye. This patient only has this eye. The other eye is nucleated. So maybe there is some, some kind of cheating going on, but, but you know, it wasn't by using the other eye if that was the case. Um, you wonder if maybe they're just very good eccentrically fixating. You wonder if somehow there are some photoreceptors that are just working, that are functional um, after, the, after the cycles. The problem with chemotherapy, of course, is that you have other issues like ototoxicity, deafness. Um, very rarely you can get leukemia. And then you can have other um, um, vascular issues like anemia. Um, you know, this is systemic chemo. Um, so it's still, it's, and these are little kids, these are infants sometimes. Um, if there's a better way of employing it, we, we try to do that. So um, we have tried a few different ways and there's the, there are some exciting ways. One, one way I want to talk about very quickly is just periocular carboplatin. So carboplatin is a chemotherapy agent, injecting it around the eye, similar to a subtenon's triamcinolone injection. Um, it has one-tenth the amount of the systemic dose, but it delivers 10 times the concentration. The problem with that is it can destroy the optic nerve. It can cause optic nerve necrosis and um, orbital fat necrosis. So we don't do that. More exciting is intraarterial infusion of chemotherapy. I should have had a poll question asking how many people have heard of this by now. It's It's been around for about 10 years, maybe a little longer. Um but it's just an amazing treatment. Basically, it was initiated in Japan. Dr. Abramson in New York kind of um, tweaked it significantly. Um, and then we've been employing it in, in Miami and Baskin Palmer's been doing it. Um, basically, what's happening is it, it started out as a salvage therapy before nucleating an eye. Now it's used as a primary treatment. Um, it uses melphalan, topotecan, and carboplatin as the, as the chemotherapy agents. What this is doing is it is snaking um, basically a, a, a microcatheter from the femoral artery to the ophthalmic artery to administer that chemotherapy agent directly into the ophthalmic artery. So it starts in the femoral artery, gets snaked all the way up. They, they do, they, the patient of course is, it's a baby. So we're talking about, you know, angel hair pasta size um, blood vessels that they're snaking this up. And um, they're anticoagulated for this. And originally when this was done, let me show you an example here. So <clears throat> this is the guide wire for the microcatheter. This is the, uh, this is actually blocking. This is a balloon. This was originally when it was done. This is the ophthalmic, this is, I'm sorry, the internal carotid artery. Here's the ophthalmic artery. They would bring it up. They'd, they'd inflate the balloon, basically causing a stroke while they administer um, the, the chemotherapy directly into the ophthalmic artery. Dr. Abramson tweaked that. He's, he was able to get an, an interventional neuroradiologist is the person that does this. And he was able to get their, in, their interventional neuroradiologist or that person was able to develop a technique where they go just past the ophthalmic artery. And then they, as they bring it back, it rests into the fork of where the ophthalmic artery goes. So they don't have to occlude the rest. The, the, um, the chemo still goes right into the, the ophthalmic artery here. And I actually have a video of them doing this. Um, this is super selective angiography, okay? And this is done also three week cycles, six weeks, um, and then every three months. It's about a half an hour of uh, pulse injections from this. So here's, here's the patient that I had the beginning of this presentation for. And this is just um, an angiogram. That's the super selective angiogram. There's the ophthalmic artery. I'm going to play this now and I'll try to describe it as it's happening. What we're going to see is they've, they've been, the angiography is there. 
we're going to see a guide wire and the delivery apparatus. And the delivery apparatus is separate. It, it gets snaked up the guide wire. Okay, I'm going to show that to you. Okay, so we have the internal carotid. This is two-dimensional. They have to move three-dimensionally. Here's the guide wire going up. That is the ophthalmic artery right there. The guide wire is going up. He's got to snake through to get to the ophthalmic artery. There's the delivery apparatus slowly coming up. You see that little black spot there? There it is. He's bringing the delivery apparatus to the edge of the guide wire, and he can stop there and kind of allows it to wedge right into the ophthalmic artery. And now he can pull away the guide wire so you're not seeing the, the hypofluorescence of the, of the guide wire, but the delivery apparatus is still there, okay? And now he can start pulsing. And here's the super selective angiography pulsing through the ophthalmic artery. It's an amazing surgery. I don't know how he does it. Um, I think it's fair to call it magic because the interventional radio neuroradiologist has to has to maneuver three dimensionally through a two dimensional picture. <laughs> um, so it's 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 one of the most amazing procedures. Dr. Murray does not do this. Um, in, in at at uh, Miami Children's where it was being done, Dr. Muhammad Ali Aziz Sultan was doing it. He was amazing. I don't think he's doing it anymore, unfortunately. So here's here's post op. This is kind of a Percher's like retinopathy. You see the the, the cotton wool spotting and the the hemorrhages everywhere. That's one month later. Here's two months later. Things are are kind of dying down. Supplemental laser. So it's still getting kind of that sandwich procedure of of chemo and laser. It's just intraarterial chemo. Three months laser later, and this is you know this this patient is is good. They're they're seeing you know luckily this was a nasal lesion. It was huge but it, it didn't uh, cause any other issues and, and they're seeing well. Now, sometimes there can be complications. One complication I got was um, after uh, an exam under anesthesia where Dr. Marie was doing the laser after the patient had the interarterial chemo pulse, the mother called and she said, hey, there's some red mark on the side of, of my baby's face. And this was like Friday night. And I said, well, you know, um, it could be just from, from the speculums that were used if it's still like that over the weekend, let's let's take a look at her. And they actually came by, I think on Wednesday or Thursday, a week later. And you can see it's it's definitely not from a speculum, right? And that's actually what we think happened was there's a route that you can use the external carotid instead of the internal carotid. And maybe uh, the, the interventional neuroradiologist uh, ner uh, zigged when he should have zagged. And he he um, chemoed the wrong area, and and that's you know that's going to go away. The problem is the eye didn't get the chemotherapy, so so um, that's a problem. So that's retinoblastoma. We have one polling question for that, and then I think we only have like uh, ten minutes left or so. About that. Okay, perfect. The, the last section is a short section, um, but the important stuff we've we've gone over, which is great. Okay, the polling question is open. The most common presenting sign and symptom of a retinoblastoma is leukocoria, strabismus, uh, red, painful eye, uh, well, baby exam. So all of those, I think, can find a retinoblastoma, but which is the most common? Joe, any questions roll in? I'm looking right now. Question is, does the procedure have to be repeated? I think that they mean the intraarterial uh, chemotherapy. And and yes, yes, every three weeks. It's it's mm -hmm. it's a, a they extend it. So I think they do three weeks and then six to nine weeks and then three months. And really with, with all chemotherapies, it's done until it, it doesn't need to be done anymore. So, so if we see um, that there's not local tumor control, unlike radiation where for, for the melanomas, when they were radiated, if the radiation didn't work, the next step is, is really a nucleation. For chemo, you can, you can keep doing more chemo if mm -hmm. you have. 
And there was a question, I'm not sure how to, the phrasing of it, retinoblastoma, insertion, deletion, what was the other? Oh, sequencing. So that's a good, that's a good okay. question. When we talk mm -hmm. about these mutations, we're talking about, is there a, uh, usually is there a sequencing? Is, are one of the, the, the base pairs um, just in the wrong sequence? Or is there an addition deletion of the base pair? I'm actually, the, the, the last case we're going to talk about is, has to do with uh, another gene. And at least for that lesion, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, I think that some patients that have an, um, a sequencing mutation may get a little luckier than addition deletion. Remember on the DNA, if you have, the DNA is coding for amino acids, which fold up into proteins. And we're just getting now, you know, things like CRISPR and computers that can actually model these things for many, many years. No one had any idea how the amino acid chains would line up to make a protein. Now we, we have an idea. And, and the question is, if you have a sequencing where there's only just two base pairs that just, they make one amino acid wrong, is that going to be as catastrophic as if you have an addition deletion where you're missing a base pair and the entire chain? Remember, amino acids, I'm bringing you back to biochemistry. Amino acids are, are um, three base pairs make, make an amino acid, if I'm not mistaken. So if you have an extra base pair or a, one less base pair, you're going to screw up all the amino acids made in that protein afterwards. And that gene won't do anything. It won't help at all. It won't do what it's supposed to be doing at all. If there's just a sequencing mutation, will the gene still function somewhat? Well, in the, in the case that we're going to present, um, it, it's I've had patients that have had very mild versions of it and very bad versions of it as far as their eye goes. Um, and we'll get more into that. 100% nailed it at oh, leukocoria. Oh, that makes wow, that never happens. <laughs> maybe, maybe my questions are too easy or maybe I'm just a really good teacher. I don't know. I'm going to go. You're a great teacher. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Well, this, listen, our last tumor that we're going to talk about is actually not an intraocular malignancy. The reason I'm including it in this lecture is because it can be associated with a systemic disease that will still kill you via um, kidney cancer, um, renal uh, adenoma, renal carcinoma. So this lesion is, first of all, let's describe it. So we're in the left eye, nice view in, beautiful orange lesion here. It looks like a vascular lesion. You've got Here's an arterial. So you've got a feeder and then you've got a nice drainer. And then around the lesion, it looks like there may be some subretinal fluid. And this is a retinal capillary hemangioma. There are other hemangiomas that we're not talking about today. So I didn't want to talk about a, a circumscribed choroidal hemangioma, a diffuse choroidal hemangioma, a cavernous hemangioma. All those hemangiomas um, won't kill you. <laughs> and this, this hemangioma won't kill you. But if the, the condition it's associated with VHL, von Hippelinda disease might, okay? So this is a retinal capillary hemangioma. There are orange red vascular tumors. Um, and really what you're looking at is the, the tumor material is, you know, in, in, in blood vessels, you have stromal tissue and endothelial tissue. And that is just a bunch of stromal cells and endothelial cells all mixed up and basically very spongy. So you're looking at this kind of spongy vascular tumor. They can occur sporadically. And usually if they occur later in life in the fifth or sixth or seventh decade of life, that's usually not associated with von Hippelinda disease. If it's younger, if it's in the third decade or fourth decade of life, that's usually um, related to von Hippelinda disease. And, and von Hippelinda disease we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, the lesions can produce subretinal and intraretinal exudation, and that's because they're spongy. Um, I mentioned offhand something called cavernous hemangiomas. Those are the cluster of grapes. Um, that's for another lecture. But those lesions have an endothelium that's that's intact. These do not have an intact endothelium. These are these are spongy lesions, and that's why they leak and they really do cause havoc to the eye. When we have patients coming in with these, it really depends on their presentation because if we can catch them before they have retinal detachments we usually do very well. If we catch them after they have retinal detachments, we, they, the patient's eyes usually do terribly. Okay. And, you know, we talk about advanced stages of this can lead to, to a secondary neovascular glaucoma, and then the eye has to come out. That's, you know, the reason to take an eye out is, is that blind, painful eye. 85% of them are like in the picture I just showed you, they're in the peripheral retina and they have those um, feeders and drainers, but 15% of them can be around or on the optic nerve. That's a juxtapapillary capillary hemangioma, also called an optic disc hemangioblastoma. 
And those lesions can be endophytic, exophytic, or sessile. Um, really, the exophytic and sessile, we're talking about the lesion being kind of subretinal or within the retina. Those terms were made before OCT, and now we have OCT and we can just look at them. So I have a picture here of a lesion that looks like it's it's coming kind of coming out at you, right? It's definitely elevated, um, but when we do an OCT of this lesion, you can see it's actually under the retina more than anything. You have a lot of retinal thickening from the exudation. You have exudate here and intraretinal fluid, and exudation is, is a sign of chronicity. So this is a juxtapapillary lesion that I, that's actually exophytic. Here's an endophytic lesion. I don't know if anyone can tell. Well, there's some ex. Th this is actually this patient presented with a history of asteroid hyalosis. So you don't know if this is vitreous exudation or just normal asteroid. This is a macular hole. Can you guys see that? Yep. We have an hey. ancient, an ancient hey. stratus OCT here. Hey, oh, Aaron, can you do me a favor? Sure. Um, you've been talking endophytic, exophytic. Yes. Uh, maybe just do a quick definition yes. of those for yes. our attendees. En endophytic is is basically protruding into the vitreous. Let me show you an example. This is endophytic. Exophytic is in kind of the the outer retina near RPE and it's still elevated but it's it's not so much protruding into the vitreous. This is kind of all sensory retina area just protruding right into the vitreous. You you asked that question at the perfect time because this is the perfect example. Okay? In this patient's case I think this this endophytic proliferation of this tumor actually caused this macular hole. You can see it's an asymmetric macular hole pushing forward this way, and there's no real leakage associated with this. So I think that in this case, that's why I'm mentioning it. It's just it can do some funny things. But the the take home here is when the lesion is on the nerve, it's harder to treat. It's harder to treat when it's when it's peripheral and there's no retinal detachment. You can actually laser ablate the the um, feeder vessel and the tumor, and that usually does a pretty good job at limiting the chance of it kind of leaking and causing a tractional serous complex retinal detachment. And that's what this next slide actually mentions. So um, the treatment is really determined by how many of these lesions there are and where they are and the size of them, okay? And the treatments include observation, anti-VEGF, PDT, external beam radiotherapy, black, proton beam, everything, cryotherapy, laser ablation for the small lesions I just mentioned, and vitreoretinal surgery. So I'm going to show you one more. This will be the last video I show you. That patient that had the macular hole with the lesion, uh, Dr. Murray decided to do a pars plan of vitrectomy, a membrane peel. He did endo laser. He did um, an air fluid exchange with gas insertion. So let's take a quick look at that. Even though I'm not a surgeon, I'll try to describe it the best I can. He also did cataract surgery first, so he's he's doing the cataract surgery now. He's doing phacal emulsification, cracking things up, putting the intraocular lens in. The fact that this patient had um, asteroid hyalosis mm -hmm. gives us a much better appreciation of where the vitreous is. And whatever camera they're using is is kind of incredible here too. So he's, he's starting anterior vitrectomy. Now he's doing more vitrectomy here. So you can see he's sucking up the vitreous. Years We'll have surgical fellows with us. And years ago, I was talking to our, our fellow at the time, um, Victor Viegas, and I said, I, I don't know if Tim was doing this or one of the other fellows was doing this. And Victor started laughing because he's like, no, 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 no. This is definitely Dr. Murray doing this. A fellow doesn't doesn't do this kind of membrane. What you're gonna, about to see, he's going to use ICG with a membrane peel, and he makes it look easy, you know. Uh, but apparently, there's there's some skill uh, associated with this. There's the ICG dye. and that's there's a membrane peel, and then he's going to laser ablate the lesion um, after he does the membrane peel. I think it'll just be another few seconds. And there's some laser. And we've got a before and after. Unfortunately, the vision isn't much better. It's, you know, from, from 2400 to 2200, but the eye is stable. And, and really what we worry about is, is von Hippelinda disease 
also in addition to, to treating the eye. So I'm going to skip ahead to that. This is a lesion I actually saw at a Pearl Vision, um, a patient 45 years old, classic retinal capillary hemangioma. What is that? We have an ICG, um, thoracene angiography. This is the FA. This is the ICG. In the ICG, this lesion, this lesion is retinal. It's not, it's not present in the cloid. Um, so this patient has the clinical definition. More than one lesion in the eye or a lesion in the eye with a lesion in in, in the body is clinical definition of, of VHL. And very, very quickly, I know we're, we're running out of time here. Very quickly, it's VHL is caused by a single gene. It's a, a gene that regulates another gene that regulates VEGF, HIL, I believe, that regulates, um, HIF regulates VEGF. So when you have the VHL gene not working, you have, you have this expression of VEGF throughout the body. And we know about VEGF because of, of neovascular um, AMD and, and diabetes and everything. And when we talk about other lesions in the body, you know, yes, we talk about hemangioblastomas in the cerebellum or the spine, but you can also have retinal cysts. You can have something called pheochromocytomas. These are tumors of the adrenal glands. You can have pancreatic cysts. And then adjacent to the renal cysts, you can have the renal cell carcinoma. And that's in 22% of patients, that's fatal if they don't know what, what they have, if they're not being watched. So I'm going to skip the last patient. This was an interesting patient with bilateral um, lesions, and she had brain tumor. You guys can ask me any questions about that later if you want, and we can go right to the polling. And did this course improve your confidence in appropriately identifying, identifying choroidal melanoma? And, I and that question is now open. So I hope no one picks a D. If they do, I won't tell you. <laughs> Thanks. So while this question is going off, um, Aaron, I am sure you get plenty of lesions sent to you that are <laughs> nevi, um, uh, chirpies, so on and so forth. Um, do you have a lecture similar to that that I think that the attendees like would uh, would benefit from? Absolutely. So so the you know um, my other big lecture is is really on lesions that that aren't so dangerous. Um, I'll still talk a little bit about melanoma and I'll still mention retinoblastoma, but going over chirpy chirpies is are, are what we see. Um, nevi, you know, we have to talk about that. The reason I still talk about melanoma is because when you talk about a nevus, you have to worry about a melanoma. Um, but then there are astrocytomas. There, there are, there are hamartomas, uh, like an astrocytic hamartoma or a combined hamartoma or a simple hamartoma of the RPE. And then there are vascular hamartomas like the choroidal hemangiomas. I have a lecture where I go over all of the other potpourri, so to speak. And the, the issues they can cause the eye, even if they're not causing... Uh, a, a life-threatening condition. So one quick question, and we'll wrap this up here, is um, is it still one in 9,000 if you see a nevus in the back of the eye that can convert to a melanoma? Yep. And yep. with that said, how do you follow uh, maybe a newly diagnosed nevus? So so, um, so yes, to answer your question, we, we still think it's around one out of eight to 9,000 um, that can just convert. Even a norm, we're, not, we're talking about not atypical, has none of the atypical features. Um, if it doesn't have atypical features, ev first of all, everyone has their own comfort level. And if someone wants to refer a patient out that has the smallest nevus ever, but they just don't want to deal with it, I, I respect that. I, I totally understand that. That said, if it has no significant thickness and if it's under three disc diameters, I think it's totally appropriate to take a picture, educate the patient, and have them come back at least in a year, preferably six months, but at least in a year, so that they can reevaluate the lesion. Um, you know, between three and five disc diameters is kind of when you're out of that comfort zone, right? Um, and that's really up to you. And 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 then, you know, you don't have to send it right to an ocular oncologist. You can if you want, but you can send it to a local retina specialist. Most retina specialists will will watch these lesions. You know, Tim has never said, "Oh, that doctor shouldn't have sent us this this." this patient. He's never said that to me. He will watch, you know, a normal, you know, chirpy that's, you know, but died, you he'll make sure there's no problems with it. Um, you know, we'll see them, you know, once or twice a year and that'll be it. Uh, but, but, um, I think, I think personal comfort level is, is kind of key there. Sure. 
Well, you did a great job because you have uh, 92% that are saying yes. Oh. Um, you have 8% somewhat. You have no one saying not at all and no one saying what is a choroidal melanoma. So. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. All right. So I'm going to close the display. Thank you so much. Gonna, yep. You can Thank get you, ahead and stop. That's terrific. Oh, thanks. So yeah, shall I change? Stop sharing. Yep. Or I can knock you off. And uh, uh, let me see if I can do it. There we go. Just had to change that. There yep. you go. I'm going to share this. And I'm going to put this slide here first. What I want to point out to everyone is the, uh, the survey poll is open. If you click this button right here, you can start doing the survey poll while we while we wrap up here. Um, with that said, I think we've answered all the questions. Is that correct, Joe? I haven't been really watching. Been we have polls. we have answered all the questions. We're all good. So, Aaron, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank what you. a what a, a pleasure. What a great lecture to help us out at OEC here. Um, go ahead. I knew you were going to make a comment. Oh I, no! Thank you. It was a pleasure. This was fun. I'm I'm happy to do it. Yeah. Joe, any comments before we wrap up the CE? No, I think that was a, that was a unique perspective from a person uh, and a clinician and an educator who's in a very unique practice situation. So your insights were extremely valuable, Aaron. We really appreciate it. All right, everyone. So thank you. This was uh, Dissecting Malignant Interocular Lesions from Diagnosis to Management. This was a Sinker's virtual course. Uh, thank you for attending. That will wrap up the education.